Section 3 of Four Science Fiction Stories by Alan E. Norse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bear Trap Part 3 He found a small wooden glade not far from the library, and set the copter down skillfully. His mind numbed, fighting to see through the haze to the core of incredible truth he had discovered. The great, jagged piece, so long missing, was suddenly plopped right down into the middle of the puzzle, and now it didn't fit. There were still holes, holes that obscured the picture and twisted it into a nightmarish impossibility. He snapped the phone switch, tried three numbers without any success, and finally reached the fourth. He heard Dr. Prex's sharp voice on the wire. Anything happened since I left Prex? Nothing remarkable, the doctor's voice sounded tired. Somebody tried to call Mariel on the visiphone about an hour after you had gone, and then signed off in a hurry when he saw somebody else around. I don't know who it was, but he sounded mighty agitated. The doctor's voice paused. Anything new, Tom? Plenty, growled Chander bitterly, but you'll have to read it in the newspapers. He flipped off the connection before Prex could reply. Then Chander sank back and slept the sleep of total exhaustion, hoping that a rest would make the shimmering, indefinite picture hold still long enough for him to study it. And as he drifted into troubled sleep, a greater and more pressing question wormed upward into his mind. He woke with a jolt, just as the sun was going down, and he knew then with perfect clarity what he had to do. He checked quickly to see that he had been undisturbed, and then manipulated the controls of the copter. Easing the ship into the sky toward Washington, he searched out a news report on the radio, listened with a dull feeling in the pit of his stomach as the story came through about the breakdown of the Berlin Conference, the declaration of war, the President's meeting with Congress that morning, his formal request for full wartime power, the granting of permission by a wide-eyed, frightened legislature. Chander settled back, staring dully at the ground moving below him, the wisps of evening haze rising over the darkening land. There was only one thing to do. He had to have Ingersoll's files. He knew only one way to get them. Half an hour later he was settling the ship down under cover of darkness, on the vast grounds behind the Ingersoll estate, cutting the motors to effect a quiet landing. Tramping down the ravine toward the huge house, he saw it was dark. Down by the gate he could see the security guard standing in a haze of blue cigarette smoke under the dim outlights. Cautiously he slipped across the back terrace, crossing behind the house, and jangled a bell on the side porch. Ann Ingersoll opened the door, and gasped as Sander forced his way in. "'Keep quiet,' he hissed, slipping the door shut behind him. Then he sighed and walked through the entrance into the large front room. Tom, oh Tom, I was afraid, oh Tom. Suddenly she was in his arms sobbing, pressing her face against his shirt front. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Tom. He disengaged her, turning from her and walking across the room. Let's turn it off, Anne, he said disgustedly. It's not very impressive. Tom, I, I wanted to tell you. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't believe them when they said you wouldn't be harmed. I was afraid. Oh, Tom, I wanted to tell you. Believe me. You didn't tell me, he snapped. They were nervous. They slipped up. That's the only reason I'm alive. They planned to kill me. She stared at him tearfully, shaking her head from side to side, searching for words. I, I didn't want that. He whirled, his eyes blazing. You silly fool, what do you think you're doing when you play games with a mob like this? Do you think they're going to play fair? You're no clod, you know better than that. He leaned over her, trembling with anger. You set me up for a sucker, but the plan fell through, and now I'm running around loose, and if you thought I was dangerous before, you haven't seen anything like how dangerous I am now. You're going to tell me some things now, and you're going to tell them straight. You're going to tell me where Harry Dartmouth went with those files, 
where they are right now. Understand that? I want those files. Because when I have them, I'm going to do exactly what I started out to do. I'm going to write a story, the whole rotten story about your precious father and his two-faced life. I'm going to write about Dartmouth Bearing Corporation and all its funky outfits, and tell them what they've done to this country and the people of this country. He paused, breathing heavily, and sank down on a chair, staring at her. I've learned things in the past twenty-four hours I never dreamed could be true. I should be able to believe anything, I suppose, but these things knock my stilts out from under me. This country has been had, right straight down the line, for a dozen years. We've been sold down the river like a pack of slaves, and now we're going to get a look at the cold, ugly truth for once. She stared at him. What do you mean, about my precious father? Your precious father was at the bottom of the whole slimy mess. No, no, not Dad. She shook her head, face chalky. Harry Dartmouth, maybe, but not Dad. Listen a minute. I didn't set you up for anything. I didn't know what Dartmouth and Muriel were up to. Dad left instructions for me to contact Harry Dartmouth immediately, in case he died. He told me that, oh, a year ago. He told me that before I did anything else, I should contact Dartmouth and do as he said. So when he died, I contacted Harry and kept in contact with him. He told me you were out to burn my father, to heap garbage on him after he was dead before the people who loved him, and he said the first thing you would want would be his personal files. Tom, I didn't know you then. I knew Harry, and knew that Dad trusted him, for some reason, so I believed him. But I began to realize that what he said wasn't true. I got the files, and he said to give them to you, to string you along, and he'd pick them up from you before you had a chance to do any harm with them. He said he wouldn't hurt you, but I, I didn't believe him, Tom. I believed you, that you wanted to give Dad a fair shake. Shander was on his feet, his eyes blazing. So you turned them over to Dartmouth anyway? And what do you think he's done with them? Can you tell me that? Where's he gone? Has he burnt them? If not, what's he going to do with them? Her voice was weak and she looked as if she were about to faint. That's what I'm trying to tell you, she said shakily. He doesn't have them. I have them. Shander's jaw dropped. Now wait a minute he said softly. You gave me the briefcase. Muriel snatched it and nearly killed me. A dummy, Tom. I didn't know who to trust, but I knew I believed you more than I believed Harry. Things happened so fast, and I was so confused. She looked straight at him. I gave you a dummy, Tom. His knees walked out from under him, then, and he sank into a chair. You've got them here, then, he said weakly. Yes, I have them here. The room was in the back of the house, a small, crowded study, with a green-shaded desk lamp. Shander dumped the contents of the briefcase onto the desk and settled down, his heart pounding in his throat. He started at the top of the pile, sifting, ripping out huge sheaves of paper, receipts, notes, journals, clippings. He hardly noticed when the girl slipped out of the room and he was deep in study when she returned half an hour later with steaming black coffee. With a grunt of thanks he drank it, never shifting his attention from the scatter of papers, papers from the personal file of a dead man. And slowly the picture unfolded. An ugly picture, a picture of deceit, a picture full of lies, full of secret promises, a picture of scheming, of plotting, planning, influencing, coercing, cheating, propagandizing, all with one single-minded aim, with a terrible single goal. Shander read, numbly, his mind twisting in protest as the picture unfolded. David Ingersoll's control of Dartmouth Bearing Corporation and its growing horde of subsidiaries under the figurehead of his protege, Harry Dartmouth. The huge profits from the Chinese War, the relaxation of control laws, the millions of War I dollars plowed back into government bonds, in a thousand different names, 
all controlled by Dartmouth Bearing Corporation. And Ingersoll's own work in the diplomatic field, an incredibly, skillfully, incredibly evil channeling of power and pressure toward the inevitable goal, hidden under the cloak of peaceful respectability and popular support. The careful treaties, quietly organizing a dozen national economics, antagonizing the great nation to the east under the all-too-acceptable guise of peace through strength. Reciprocal trade agreements bitterly antagonistic to Russian economic development. The continual bickering, the skillful manipulation hidden under the powerful propaganda cloak of a hundred publications, all coursing to one ultimate, terrible goal, all with one purpose, one aim. War. War with anybody. War in the field and war on the diplomatic front. Traces even remained of the work done within the enemy nations bitter anti-Ingersoll propaganda from within the ranks of Russia herself, manipulated to strengthen Ingersoll in America, to build him up, to drive the nations farther apart, while presenting Ingersoll as the pathetic prince of world peace, fighting desperately to stop the ponderous wheels of the irresistible juggernaut. And in America, the constant, unremitting literary and editorial drum-beating, pressuring greater war preparation, distilling hatreds in a thousand circles, focusing them into a single channel. Tremendous propaganda pressure to build armies, to build weapons, to get the moon rocket project underway. Shandor sat back, eyes drooping, fighting to keep his eyes open. His mind was numb, his body trembling. A sheaf of papers in a separate folder caught his eye. Production records of the Dartmouth Bearing Corporation, almost up to the date of Ingersoll's death. Shander frowned, a snag in the chain drawing his attention. He peered at the papers, vaguely puzzled. Invoices from the Chicago plant, materials for tanks and guns and shells. Steel chemicals, the same for the New Jersey plant, the same with a dozen subsidiary plants. Shipments of magnesium and silver wire to the rocket project in Arizona, carried through several subsidiary offices. The construction of a huge calculator for the project in Arizona. Motors and materials, all for Arizona. Something caught his mind, brought a frown to his large bland face. Some off-key note in the monstrous symphony of production and intrigue that threw up a red flag in his mind, screamed for attention and then he sipped the fresh coffee at his elbow and sighed, and looked up at the girl standing there, saw her hand tremble as she steadied herself against the desk, and sat down beside him. He felt great confusion, suddenly, a vast sympathy for this girl, and he wanted to take her in his arms, hold her close, protect her, somehow. She didn't know, she couldn't know about this horrible thing. She couldn't have been a party to it, a part of it. He knew the evidence said yes. She knows the whole story. She helped them. But he also knew that the evidence somehow was wrong, that somehow he still didn't have the whole picture. She looked at him, her voice trembling. You're wrong, Tom, she said. He shook his head helplessly. I'm sorry. It's horrible, I know. But I'm not wrong. This war was planned. We've been puppets on strings, and one man engineered it, from the very start. Your father. Her eyes were filled with tears, and she shook her head, running a tired hand across her forehead. You didn't know him, Tom. If you did, you'd know how wrong you are. He was a great man, fine man, but above all, he was a good man. Only a monster could have done what you're thinking. Dad hated war. He fought it all his life. He couldn't be the monster you think. Tom's voice was soft in the darkened room, his eyes catching the downcast face of the trembling girl, fighting to believe in a phantom, and his hatred for the power that could trample a faith like that suddenly swelled up in bitter hopeless rage. It's here, on paper. It can't be denied. It's hateful, but it's here. 
it's what i set out to learn it's not a lie this time and it's the truth and this time it's got to be told i've written my last false story this one is going to the people the way it is this one's going to be the truth he stopped staring at her the puzzling twisted hole in the puzzle was suddenly there staring him in the face falling down into place in his mind with blazing clarity staring he dived into the pile of papers again searching frantically searching for the missing piece something he had seen and passed over the one single piece of the story that didn't make sense and he found it on the list of materials shipped to the nevada plant pig iron raw magnesium raw copper steel electron tubes plastics from all parts of the country all being shipped to the dartmouth plant in nevada where they made only shells at first he thought it was only a rumble in his mind the shocking realization storming through then he saw ann jump up suddenly white-faced and race to the window and he heard the small scream in her throat and then the rumbling grew louder stronger and the house trembled he heard the whine of jet planes screaming over the house as he joined her at the window heard the screaming whines mingled with the rumbling thunder and far away on the horizon the red glare was glowing rising burning up to a roaring conflagration in the black night sky washington her voice was small infinitely frightened yes that's washington then it really has started she turned to him with eyes wide with horror and snuggled up to his chest like a frightened child oh tom it's here what we've been waiting for what your father started could never be stopped any other way than this the roar was louder now rising to a whining scream as another squad of dark ships roared overhead moving east and south jets whistling in the night this is what your father wanted she was crying great sobs shaking her shoulders you're wrong you're wrong oh tom you must be wrong his voice was low almost inaudible in the thundering roar of the bombardment ann i've got to go ahead i've got to go tonight to nevada to the dartmouth plant there i know i'm right but i have to go to check something to make sure of something he paused looking down at her i'll be back ann but i'm afraid of what i'll find out there i need you behind me especially with what i have to do i need you you've got to decide are you for me or against me she shook her head sadly and sank into a chair gently removing his hands from her waist i love my father tom she said in a beaten voice i can't help what he's done i loved him i i can't be with you tom far below him he could see the cars jamming the roads leaving washington he could almost hear the noise the screeching of brakes the fist fights the shouts the bladding of horns he moved south over open country hoping to avoid the places where the copter might be spotted and stopped for questioning he knew that hart would have an alarm out for him by now and he didn't dare risk being stopped until he reached his destination the place where the last piece of the puzzle could be found the answer to the question that was burning through his mind shells were made of steel and chemicals the tools that made them were also made of steel not manganese not copper not electron relays nor plastic nor liquid oxygen just steel the copter relayed south and then turned west over kentucky shander checked the auxiliary tanks which he had filled at the library landing field that morning then he turned the ship to robot controls and sank back in the seat to rest his whole body clamored for sleep but he knew he dare not sleep any slip any contact with army aircraft or security patrol would throw everything into the fire for hours he sat gazing hypnotically at the black expanse of land below flying high over the pitch-black countryside not a light showed not a sign of life bored he flipped the radio button located a news broadcast 
the bombed area did not extend west of the Appalachians. Washington, D.C. was badly hit, as were New York and Philadelphia, and further raids were expected to originate from Siberia, coming across the Great Circle to the West Coast or the Middle West. So far the enemy appears to have lived up to its agreement in the Ingersoll Pact to outlaw use of atomic bombs, for no atomic weapons have been used so far, but the damage with blockbusters has been very heavy. All citizens are urged to maintain strictest blackout regulations and report as called upon in local work and civil defense pools as they are set up. The attack began. Shander sighed, checked his instrument readings. Far in the east, the horizon was beginning to lighten, a healthy, white-gray light. His calculations placed him over eastern Nebraska and a few moments later he nosed down cautiously and verified his location. Lincoln Air Base was a flurry of activity. The field was alive with men, like little black ants, preparing the reserve fighters and pursuits for use in a fever of urgent speed. Suddenly the copter radio bleeped, and Tom threw the switch. Over. An angry voice snarled. You up there, whoever you are, where'd you leave your brains? No civilian craft are allowed in the air, and that's orders straight from Washington. Don't you know there's a war on? Now get down here, before you're shot down. Shander thought quickly. This is a federal security ship, he snapped. I'm just on reconnaissance. The voice was cautious. Security, what's your cooperation number? Shander cursed. JF-223R-864. Name is Jerry Chandler. Give it a check if you want to. He flipped the switch and accelerated for the ridge of hills that marked the Colorado border as the radio signal continued to bleep angrily. A trio of pursuit planes on the ground began warming up. Shander sighed, hoping they would check before they sent ships after him. It might at least delay them until he reached his destination. Another hour carried him to the heart of the Rockies, and across the great salt fields of Utah. His fuel tanks were low, being emptied one by one as the tiny ship sped through the bright morning sky, and Tom was growing uneasy, until suddenly, far to the west and slightly to the north, he spotted the plant, nestling in the mountain foothills. It lay far below, sprawling like some sort of a giant spider across the rugged terrain. Several hundred cars spread out to the south of the plant, and he could see others speeding in from the temporary village across the ridge. Everything was quiet, orderly. He could see the shipments, crated, sitting in freight cars to the north. And then he saw the drill line running over to the right of the plant. He followed it, quickly checking a topographical map in the cockpit, and his heart started pounding. The railroad branch ran between two low peaks and curved out toward the desert. Moving over it he saw the curve, saw it as it cut off to the left, and seemed to stop in the middle of the desert sand. Shander circled even lower, keeping one ear cocked on the radio, and settled the ship on the railroad line. And just as he cut the motors, he heard the shrill whine of three pursuit ships screaming in from the eastern horizon. He was out of the copter almost as soon as it had touched, throwing a jacket over his arm and racing for the place where the drill line ended. But he had seen, as he slid in for a landing, just what he had suspected from the topographical map. The drill didn't end in the middle of the desert at all. It went right on into the mountainside. The excavation was quite large the entrance covered in camouflage neatly to give the very impression that he had gotten from the air. Under the camouflage the space was crowded, stacked with crates, boxes, materials, stacked along the walls of the tunnel. He followed the rails in, lighting his way with a small pocket flashlight when the tunnel turned a corner, cutting off the daylight. Suddenly the tunnel widened, opening out into a much wider room. He sensed, rather than saw, the immense size of the vault, smelt the odd, bitter odor in the air. With the flashlight he probed the darkness, 
spotting the high vaulted ceiling above him and below him at first he couldn't see probing the vast excavation before him and then strangely he saw but couldn't realize what he saw he stared for a solid minute uncomprehending then stifling a gasp he knew what he was looking at lights he had to have lights to see clearly what he couldn't believe frantically he spun the flashlight seeking a light panel and then fascinated he turned the little oval of light back to the pit and then he heard the barest whisper of sound the faintest intake of breath and he ducked frozen as a blow whistled past his ear a second blow from the side caught him solidly in the blackness grunting flailing out into a tangle of legs and arms cursing catching a foot in his face striking up into soft yielding flesh and his head suddenly exploded into a million dazzling lights as he sank unconscious to the ground it was a tiny room completely without windows the artificial light filtering from ventilation slits near the top shander sat up shaking as the chill of the room became painfully evident a small electric heater sat in the corner beaming valiantly but the heat hardly reached his numb toes he stood up shaking himself slapping his arms against his sides to drive off the coldness and he heard a noise through the door as soon as he had made a sound muted footsteps stopped outside the door and a huge man stepped inside he looked at shander carefully then closed the door behind him without locking it i'm baker he rasped cheerfully how are you feeling shander rubbed his head suddenly and acutely aware of a very sore nose and a bruised rib cage not so hot he muttered how long have i been out long enough the man pulled out a plug of tobacco ripped off a chunk with his teeth chew i smoke shander fished for cigarettes in an empty pocket not in here you don't said baker he shrugged his huge shoulders and settled affably down on a bench near the wall you feel like talking shander eyed the unlocked door and turned his eyes to the huge man sure he said what do you want to talk about i don't want to talk about nothing the big man replied indifferently thought you might though are you the one that roughed me up yeah baker grinned hope i didn't hurt you much boss said to keep you in one piece but we had to hurry up and take care of those army guys you brought in on your tail that was dumb you almost upset everything memory flooded back and shander's eyes widened yes they followed me all the way from lincoln what happened to them baker grinned and chomped his tobacco they're a long way away now don't worry about them shander eyed the door uneasily the latch hadn't caught and the door had swung open an inch or two where am i he asked inching toward the door what what are you planning to do to me baker watched him edge away you're safe he said the boss'll talk to you pretty soon if you feel like it he squinted at tom in surprise pointing an indolent thumb toward the door you planning to go out or something tom stopped short his face red the big man shrugged go ahead i ain't going to stop you he grinned go as far as you can without a word shander threw open the door looked out into the concrete corridor at the end was a large bright room cautiously he started down then suddenly let out a cry and broke into a run his eyes wide he reached the room a large room with heavy plastic windows he ran to one of the windows pulse pounding and stared a cry choking in his throat the blackness of the crags contrasted dimly with the inky blackness of the sky beyond mile upon mile of jagged rocky crags black rock ageless unaged rock and it struck him with a jolt how easily he had been able to run how lightning swift his movements he stared again and then he saw what he had seen in the pit standing high outside the building on a rocky flat 
standing bright and silvery like a phantom finger pointing to the inky heavens sleek smooth resting on polished tail fins like another worldly bird poised for flight a voice behind him said you aren't really going any place you know why run it was a soft voice a kindly voice cultured not rough and biting like baker's voice it came from directly behind shander and he felt his skin crawl he had heard that voice before many times before even in his dreams he had heard that voice you see it's pretty cold out there and there isn't any air you're on the moon mr shandor he whirled his face twisted and white and he stared at the small figure standing at the door a stoop-shouldered man white hair slightly untidy crow's feet about his tired eyes an old man with eyes that carried a sparkle of youth and kindness the eyes of david p ingersoll shander stared for a long moment shaking his head like a man seeing a phantom when he found words his voice was choked the words wretched out as if by force you you're alive yes i'm alive then shander shook his head violently turning to the window and back to the small white-haired man then your death was just a fake the old man nodded tiredly that's right just a fake shander stumbled to a chair and sat down woodenly i don't get it he said dully i just don't get it the war that that i can see i can see how you worked it how you engineered it but this he gestured feebly at the window at the black impossible landscape outside this i can't see they're bombing us to pieces they're bombing out washington probably your home your own family last night he stopped frowning in confusion no it couldn't have been done last night two days ago well whatever day it was they were bombing us to pieces and you're up here why what's it going to get you this war this whole rotten intrigue mess and then this the old man walked across the room and stared for a moment at the silent ship outside i hope i can make you understand we had to come here we had no choice we couldn't do what we wanted any other way than to come here first before anybody else but why here they're building a rocket there in arizona they'll be up here in a few days maybe a few weeks approximately forty-eight hours corrected ingersoll quietly within forty-eight hours the arizona rocket will be here if the russian rocket doesn't get here first it doesn't make sense it won't do you any good to be here if the earth is blasted to bits why come here and why bring me here of all people what do you want with me ingersoll smiled and sat down opposite shander take it easy he said gently you're here you're safe and you're going to get the whole story i realize that this is a bit of a jolt but you had to be jolted with you i think the jolt will be very beneficial since we want you with us that's why we brought you here we need your help and we need it very badly it's as simple as that shandor was on his feet his eyes blazing no dice this is your game not mine i don't want anything to do with it but you know the game i know plenty of the game i followed the trail right from the start i know the whole rotten mess the trail led me all the way around robin hood's barn but it told me things oh it told me plenty it told me about you and this war and now you want me to help you what do you want me to do go down and tell the people it isn't really so bad being pounded to shreds should i tell them they aren't really being bombed it's all in their minds shall i tell them this is a war to defend their freedoms that it's a great crusade against the evil forces of the world what kind of sap do you think i am he walked to the window his whole body trembling with anger i followed this trail down to the end i scraped my way down into the dirtiest slimiest depths of the barrel and i found you down there 
and your rotten corporations and your crowd of healers and on the other side are three hundred million people taking the lash end of the whip on earth helping to feed you and you ask me to help you once upon a time ingersoll interrupted quietly there was a fox shander stopped and stared at him and the fox got caught in a trap a big bear trap with steel jaws that clamped down on him and held him fast by the leg he wrenched and he pulled but he couldn't break the trap open no matter what he did and the fox knew that the farmer would come along almost any time to open that bear trap and the fox knew the farmer would kill him he knew that if he didn't get out of that trap he'd be finished sure as sin but he was a clever fox and he found a way to get out of the bear trap ingersoll's voice was low tense in the still room do you know what he did shander shook his head silently it was a very simple solution said ingersoll drastic but simple he gnawed off his leg another man had entered the room a small weasel-faced man with sallow cheeks and slick black hair ingersoll looked up with a smile but mariel waved him on and took a seat nearby so he chewed off his leg shander repeated dully i don't get it the world is a trap said ingersoll watching shander with quiet eyes a great big bear trap it's been in that trap for decades ever since the first world war the world has come to a wall it can't climb a trap it can't get out of a vicious painful torturous trap and the world has been struggling for seven decades to get out it hasn't succeeded and the time is drawing rapidly nigh for the farmer to come something had to be done and done fast before it was too late the fox had to chew off its leg and i had to bring the world to the brink of a major war shander shook his head his mind buzzing i don't see what you mean we never had a chance for peace we never had a chance to get our feet on the ground from one round to the next no time to do anything worth while in the past seventy years i don't see what you mean about a trap ingersoll settled back in his chair the light catching his face in sharp profile it's been a century of almost continuous war he said you've pointed out the whole trouble we haven't had time to catch our breath to make real peace the first world war was a sorry affair by our standards almost a relic of earlier european wars trench fighting poor rifles soap-box aircraft nothing to distinguish it from earlier wars but its scope but twenty uneasy years went by and another war began a very different sort of war this one had fast aircraft fast mechanized forces heavy bombing and finally to cap the climax atomics that second world war could hold up its head as a real strapping fighting war in any society of wars it was a stiff war a terrible one quite a bit of progress for twenty years but essentially it was a war of ideologies just as the previous one had been a war of intolerance of unmixable ideas the old man paused and drew a sip of water from the canister in the corner somewhere somehow the world had missed the boat those wars didn't solve anything they didn't even make a very strong pretense they just made things worse somewhere human society had gotten into the trap a vicious cycle it had reached the end of its progressive tether it had no place to go no place to expand to great common goal so ideologies arose to try to solve the dilemma of a basically static society and they fought wars they reached a point finally where they could destroy themselves unless they broke the vicious cycle somehow shander looked up a deep frown on his face you're trying to say that they needed a new frontier exactly they desperately needed it there was only one more frontier they could reach for a frontier which once attained had no real end he gestured toward the black landscape outside there's the frontier space 
the one thing that could bring human wars to an end a vast limitless frontier which could drive men's spirits upward and outward for the rest of time and that frontier seemed unattainable it was blocked off by a wall by the jaws of a trap oh they tried after the first war the work began the second war contributed unimaginably to the technical knowledge but after the second war they could go no further because it cost money it required a tremendous effort on the part of the people of a great nation to do it and they couldn't see why they should spend the money to get to space after all they had to work up the atomics and new weapons for the next war it was a trap as strong and treacherous as any the people of the world had ever encountered the answer of course was obvious each war brought a great surge of technological development to build better weapons to fight bigger wars some developments led to extremely beneficial ends too if it hadn't been for the second war a certain british biologist might still be piddling around his understaffed underpaid laboratory wishing he had more money and wondering why it was that the dirty patch of mold on his petri dish seemed to keep bacteria from growing but the second war created a sudden frantic urgent demand for something anything that would stop infection fast and in no time penicillin was in mass production saving untold thousands of lives there was no question of money look at the manhattan project how many millions went into that it gave us atomic power for war and for peace for peaceful purposes the money would have never been spent but if it was for the sake of war ingersoll smiled tiredly sounds insane doesn't it but look at the record i looked at the record way back at the end of the war with china other men looked at the record too we got together and talked we knew that the military advantage of a rocket base on the moon could be a deciding factor in another major war military experts had recognized that fact back in the nineteen fifties another war could give men the technological kick they needed to get them into space possibly in time if men got to space before they destroyed themselves the trap would be broken the frontier would be opened and men could turn their energies away from destruction toward something infinitely greater and more important with space on his hands men could get along without wars but if we waited for peacetime to go to space we might never make it it might be too late it was a dreadful undertaking i saw the wealth in the company i directed and controlled at the end of the chinese war and the idea grew strong i saw that a huge industrial amalgamation could be undertaken and succeed we had a weapon in our favor the most dangerous weapon ever devised a thousand times more potent than atomics hitler used it with terrible success stalin used it harold singh used it why couldn't ingersoll use it propaganda a terrible weapon it could make people think the right way it could make them think almost any way it made them think of war far from the end of the last war we started with propaganda with politics and money the group grew stronger as our power became more clearly understood mariel handled propaganda through the newspapers and pib and magazines a very clever man and harry dartmouth handled production i handled the politics and diplomacy we had but one aim in mind to bring about a threat of major war that would drive men to space to the moon to a man-made satellite somewhere or anywhere to break through the earth's gravity to get to space and we aimed at a controlled war we had the power to do it we had the money and the plants we just had to be certain it wasn't the ultimate war it wasn't easy to make sure that atomic weapons weren't used this time but they will not both nations are too much afraid thanks to our propaganda program they both leaped at a chance to make a face-saving agreement and we hoped that the war would be held off until we got to the moon 
and until the arizona rocket project could get a ship launched for the moon the wheels we had started just moved too fast i saw at the beginning of the berlin conference that it would explode into war so i decided the time for my death had arrived i had to come here to make sure the war doesn't go on any longer than necessary shander looked up at the old man his eyes tired i still don't see where i'm supposed to fit in i don't see why you came here at all was that a wild goose chase i ran down there learning about this not a wild goose chase the important work can't start you see until the rocket gets here it wouldn't do much good if the arizona rocket got here to fight the war it may come for war but it must go back for peace we built this rocket to get us here first build it from government specifications though they didn't know it we had the plan to build it in and we were able to hire technologists not to find the right answers in arizona until we were finished because the whole value of the war threat depends solely and completely upon our getting here first when the arizona rocket gets to the moon the war must be stopped only then can we start the real operation bear trap that ship whether american or russian will meet with a great surprise when it reaches the moon we haven't been spotted here we left in darkness and solitude and if we were seen it was chalked off as a guided missile we're well camouflaged and although we don't have any sort of elaborate base just a couple of sealed rooms we have a ship and we have weapons when the first ship comes up here the control of the situation will be in our hands because when it comes it will be sent back with the ultimatum to all nations to cease warfare or suffer the most terrible non-partisan bombardment the world has ever seen a pinpoint bombardment from our ship here on the moon there won't be too much bickering i think the war will stop all eyes will turn to us and then the big work begins he smiled his thin face showing tired lines in the bright light i may die before the work is done i don't know nor care i have no successor nor have we any plans to perpetuate our power once the work is done as soon as the people themselves will take over the work the job is theirs because no group can hope to ultimately control space but first people must be sold on space from the bottom up they must be forced to realize the implications of a ship on the moon they must realize that the first ship was the hardest that the trap is sprung the amputation is a painful one there wasn't any known anesthetic but it will heal and from here there is no further need for war but the people must see that understand its importance they've got to have the whole story in terms that they can't mistake and that means a propagandist you have mariel said shander he had the work the experience he's getting tired he'll tell you himself his ideas are slow he isn't on his toes any longer he needs a new man a helper to take his place when the first ship comes his job is done the old man smiled i've been watching you of course for years mariel saw that you were given his job when he left pib to edit fighting world he didn't think you were the man he didn't trust you thought you had been raised too strongly on the sort of gibberish you were writing i thought you were the only man we could use so we let you follow the trail and watch to see how you handled it and when you came to the nevada plant we knew you were the man we had to have shander scowled looking first at ingersoll then at mariel's impassive face what about ann he asked his voice was unsteady she knew about it all the time no she didn't know anything about it we were afraid she had upset things when she didn't turn my files over to dartmouth as we told her we were afraid you'd go ahead and write the story as you saw it then which would have wrecked our plan completely as it was she was helping us sidestep the danger in the long run but she didn't know what she was really doing he grinned 
the error was ours of course we simply underestimated our man we didn't know you were that tenacious shander's face was haggard look i i don't know what to think this ship in arizona how long when will it come how do you know it'll ever come we waited until our agents here gave us a final report the ship may be leaving at any time but there's no doubt that it will come if it doesn't come one from russia will it won't be long he looked at shander closely you'll have to decide by then tom and if i don't go along with you we could lose it's as simple as that without a spokesman the plan could fall through completely there's only one thing you need to make your decision tom faith in men and a sure conviction that man was made for the stars and not for an endless circle of useless wars think of it tom that's what your decision means shander walked to the window stared out at the bleak landscape watched the great bluish globe of earth hanging like a huge balloon in the black sky he saw the myriad pinpoints of light in the blackness on all sides of it and shook his head trying to think so many things to think of so very many things i don't know he muttered i just don't know it was a long night ideas are cruel they become a part of a man's brain an inner part of his chemistry they carve grooves deep in his mind which aren't easily wiped away he knew he'd been living a lie a bitter hopeless endless lie all his life but a liar grows to believe his own lies even to the point of destruction he believes them it was so hard to see the picture now that he had the last piece in place a fox and a bear trap such a simple analogy war was a hellish proposition it was cruel it was evil it could be lost so very easily and it seemed so completely utterly senseless to cut off one's own leg and then he thought somewhere sometime he'd see her again perhaps they'd be old by then but perhaps not perhaps they'd still be young and perhaps she wouldn't know the true story yet perhaps he could be the first to tell her to let her know that he had been wrong maybe there could be a chance to be happy on earth sometime they might marry even there might be children to be raised for what wars and wars and more wars or was there another alternative perhaps the stars were winking brighter a hoarse shout rang through the quiet rooms ingersoll sat bolt upright turned his bright eyes to mariel and looked down the passageway and then they were crowding to the window as one of the men snapped off the lights in the room and they were staring up at the pale bluish globe that hung in the sky squinting breathless and they saw the tiny tiny burst of brightness on one side of that globe a tiny wisp of yellow cutting an arc from the edge moving farther and farther into the black circle of space around the earth slicing like a thin scimitar moving higher and higher and then magically winking out leaving a tiny evaporating trail behind it you saw it whispered mariel in the darkness you saw it david yes i saw it ingersoll breathed deeply staring into the blackness searching for a glimmer a glint some faint reassurance that it had not been a mirage they had seen and then ingersoll felt a hand in his tom shander's hand gripping his tightly wringing it and when the light snapped on again he was staring at shandor tears of happiness streaming from his pale tired eyes you saw it he whispered shander nodded his heart suddenly too large for his chest a peace settling down on him greater than any he had ever known in his life they're coming he said end of section three